Welcome to our regular Monday seminar. Uh, I welcome both people here and those who are uh, at a distance. Uh, today, uh, we will listen to a talk of Sunik Vattacharya uh, on multimodal machines from a perspective of humans. And I should say, uh, at the very beginning that unfortunately I have to leave before three o'clock and I have assured Sune that it's not because I would not like his talk, but I do have to uh, leave at that time. So please start. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Sunit Bhattacharya, a PhD student here at Ufal. And the title of my talk today is Multimodal Machines from a Perspective of Humans. So this will be the overall outline of the talk. I'll start with the introduction, motivation, uh, go through some existing work, discuss the methodology, and discuss four experiments that we have done here. So, so unless we are all living under some sort of a rock, we almost have been bombarded by news articles such as this, popularizing AI, uh, the world is ending because of AI and whatever and whatnot. And then obviously we have this guy, Elon Musk, uh, claiming the world is ending, buying Twitter. But all of these news coverage about the advances in deep learning and AI begs the question, where are we and why are we even here? In the early 1980s, when the field of neural networks was being developed, one of the early pioneers of the field, Terence Sejnowski, says that it was inspired by the actual biology of the brain as a way away from the parallel distributed, uh, the symbolic uh, AI methods that were prevalent then. And from then, from the conceptual designs of the 1980s, we have had the deep learning revolution in 2012. And from then in 2022, we are at a stage where we have generalist models like Gato. So this leads us to some facts that we should remember. One, modern deep learning systems are still loosely based on inspiration from biology that is in terms of the structure and the working of the neurons. But again, modern deep learning research is mostly focused on solving real world engineering problems. Modern deep learning systems reportedly exhibit many biological similarities with systems like CNNs and self-attention mechanism. But in the context of NLP, deep learning systems are nevertheless very bad at doing simple things like out of, the, out of distribution robustness, continual learning, learning with few examples, and most importantly, multimodal processing and merging information across modalities. Also, state-of-the-art deep learning models now reportedly perform better than humans in some tasks. So what do we make of all of these things? This leads us to these three fundamental questions. One, if humans and current AI systems were given the same multimodal tasks, how could we evaluate the performance? How could we compare their performance? Second, can we use multimodal deep learning systems to make predictions about observable human brain behavior when handling multimodal tasks? And the third question, it's uh, rather distant and far-fetched, but does biological plausibility as defined by Marble Stone help in designing systems that exhibit human learning abilities. I should clarify here, biological plausibility in this context implies that something that can be implemented by a biological system. This uh, leads to two sub questions like one, does incorporating more biologically inspired methods into deep learning systems make them more human-like or does that help them perform better than average humans in multimodal tasks? And finally, if deep learning systems indeed become more human-like, would that help us uh, understand more of human intelligence? So these are the three questions that we'll be focusing on for the rest of the talk. And as I have mentioned, the third is rather much distant. So serving the existing work, uh, the, I'll be focusing mostly on work that has been done around this theme that is humans and machines. And while we're discussing that, we know 
a lot of research has been happening in computer vision, attention mechanism, and multimodality. And there in that tiny island, there you find cognitive psychology and neuroscience because, well, I'm not an expert in this. And uh, most computer scientists use uh, research from the, that domain to sort of help them with their machine learning research. So focusing on computer vision, uh, the uh, fo focusing on computer vision, uh, ever since uh, CNNs were uh, discovered after 2014, people realized that there was a lot of uh, similarities uh, between the convolutional neural nets and the vision systems in uh, animals, more importantly with primates and other animals. Focusing on attention, we have seen that the uh, introduction of the attention mechanism has uh, created great uh, advances, especially in terms of NLP and vision. Now, interestingly, from a cognitive psychology and neuroscience viewpoint, especially from cognitive science and psychology, human attention has been studied to great detail. Now, in only the last two years, machine learning researchers have been able to find a tiny link between the human attention and the machine attention. And that's why the thin line there. Again, Multimodality is somewhat uh, recent in terms of the advances in de uh, deep learning. And we have uh, got a lot of systems that are really good at doing multimodal tasks. But again, from the perspective of cognitive psychology and neuroscience, we see that the study of human perception, the research into that has seen that humans are able to almost seamlessly integrate stuff like vision, audio, smell, and haptic senses. Uh, but unfortunately, when talking about multimodality, we're sometimes struggling with stuff like op how to uh, fuse the different modalities. What is the optimum way to fuse this? The point is there is a lot of scope to learn from them and integrate it here. Based on this motivation, uh, let's go to the methodology. So as discussed before, we're focused on mostly th three research questions. One, if humans and current AI systems were given the same multimodal tasks, how could their performance be compared? In this regard, uh, we have done two experiments that we'll be discussing during the talk. Second, can we use multimodal deep learning systems to make predictions about observable human brain behavior? Uh, again, two experiments in this regard that we'll be discussing about. The third, as discussed, is a rather far-fetched goal. So how do we really look at the problem? Of course, uh, quoting Andre, if it's a talk in Ufal and there's not a triangle, it doesn't really make much sense. So I am modifying uh, from Ogden and Richard's uh, semiotic triangle concept. So let's say we have a referent, the cat sits on the mat. There are different ways of symbolizing it. One, it could be a picture, it could be an audio, or it could be a bit of text. Now, all of this, can be represented as a concept. Now, from a deep learning perspective, this could be uh, represent, uh, learned representations, vectors of just numbers. From a human perspective, it could be stuff like cognitive data, MRI, uh, EEG, fMRI, or other things. And so how do we compare them? Now, comparing machines with machines is easier. Comparing humans and humans is again easier, but we are not really uh, concerned at human-human comparison because other people are doing it. So this comparison is rather direct. The problem comes when you're trying to compare machines and humans, which requires some indirect comparison. But this basically uh, tells us how to approach these problems, uh, both of these problems. Aimed with the methodology, let's jump to the experiments. The first experiment that I will be discussing is the EMMT. So EMMT stands for Eye Tracked Multimodal Translation Corpus. It was an experiment where we tried to study sight translation and multimodal sight translation in humans. And we used uh, this opportunity to collect a lot of cognitive data to study that. So this is how the setup actually looked like. We had an eye tracking uh, device to record the gaze data. We also had an EEG device to record the brain data. We collected the audio data and uh, just to show you. So this was how it looked like from the, the participants end. They would be just uh, resting their 
uh, my head here in the chin rest and the eye tracker would be recording their right eye. So it was a monocular eye tracking experiment. So we were just recording how their uh, right pupils were, right eye was behaving. Uh, the, to collect the EEG, we used a Muse2 uh, uh, device. And uh, the advantage of this device is it's, you can just wear it as a band and recent research suggests that people are using it in term, for studying cognition and that has shown some results. So uh, in EEG, we know that you could place the different sensors at different places. Uh, but for EEG, for the Muse2 device, we just have four sensors, TP9, AF7, AF8, and TP10. And the NZ works as a control uh, electrode. So essentially, we're collecting data from diff uh, four different parts of the brain. And so this is how we uh, divided the experiment. The entire, for every sentence, so essentially, I should first clarify that the sen uh, experiment was about giving people some English sentences and let letting them translate that into Czech. The catch was, at first, it would just simply follow a site translation setup. And then they would be introduced to an image. So as you can see, for the first stage, read, people were just expected to read the sentence. In the translate stage, people were just translating. In the third stage, we would introduce an image. And in the fourth stage, people would make a final translation based on uh, if they wanted to uh, integrate any information from the image that they saw. The sentences that we use, the English sentences, were of two kinds, ambiguous and unambiguous. And just to make the thing a bit more interesting, we experimented with three different image congruencies. So the images that we used were either related, unrelated, or there was uh, no visual clue. Uh, I would discuss that in the next slides. So this was an example screen of what people really saw in stage three when the sentence, when the image was first presented. So we would have a sentence at the top. Uh, in the middle, people would uh, see this instruction, which would remain constant throughout the experiment. And then at the bottom, people would see the image for the, uh, there. Uh, to clarify about the related image and unrelated image. So uh, this is an example of related and that is unrelated. So let's say we have a sentence, a man is moving an oven using a dolly. And you have an image. So the content of the image matches the content of the text. Then we have this sentence, a man is reaching down for something in a box. Now, if you look at the image, indeed it seems like he's reaching down probably, but then obviously it's not a box. So uh, it's really meant to create some confusion. And so the overall objective was when people saw these uh, images, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, just because it is out of the ordinary and unrelated, we would see that in the EEG and the eye tracking. Uh, next, for the uh, ambiguous sentences and the unambiguous sentences, we uh, use this following uh, data sets. We used MS Coco uh, for the unambiguous sentences. For the ambiguous, we used MS Coco, am ambiguous, lava, and the Hindi visual genome. Uh, overall, we had 200 sentences, that is 100 ambiguous and 100 unambiguous sentences with three different image congruencies. So at the end, we had uh, 600 different image and uh, text pairs. Now to give an example about the ambiguous sentences, let's take an example from the lava corpus. Danny approached the chair with a yellow bag, an example of syntactic ambiguity. So uh, who is carrying the bag? Is Danny with the bag or is the chair with the bag? Second, from the Hindi visual genome, uh, an example of lexical ambiguity, we have a sentence like the characters are Chinese. So the question is, here, uh, do we mean char characters as in written characters or a symbol, or is it like a person? Again, do we have two examples from MS Coco. First, a man climbing an elephant with a saddle attached. Example of syntactic ambiguity. We can interpret, so who, what is the saddle attached to? The man or the elephant? Or maybe another experiment, a tennis player runs in order to hit the ball, an example of lexical ambiguity. So is it a male tennis player or is it a female tennis player? Interestingly, this gets resolved once the picture is presented. So these are, this is one selected result from our analysis of the data. Uh, as you can, the x-axis shows us the different stages. 
and the y-axis shows the average time taken uh, by the participants to complete the stages. As we see, people took the most time for reading. It came down during translation. Uh, it's okay, but we are really concerned about this stage three when the images were first presented. Now, all uh, the solid lines represent ambiguity, the dashed lines represent unambiguous. Now we see that all across the stages, ambiguous sentences take more time to process, right? Also, the processing time for unrelated images and neutral images is faster for both ambiguous and unambiguous sentences. Now, this is a bit interesting. This is interesting because in psychology, we have this thing called a Stroop effect. As the name suggests, uh, you, maybe you can try. Can you name the font color of the word without reading the word, right? So classical studies have shown that when the uh, color and the text were congruent, well, the processing is easier uh, uh, rather than incongruencies. Now, when we look at this, we see that when there was a congruency condition, when there was a related image, people actually took more time to process rather than the other way around. Now, logically, obviously it makes sense, but then it's, it's a kind of stroop effect happening in our experimental setup. Now, also you might be wondering, even though uh, there was no image presented here in stages one and two, why do we see the differences? Uh, because apparently there was no picture at all. Well, we we're working on it. We don't yet know. There's a lot more data to analyze. And talking about a lot more data to analyze, uh, we collected uh, translation, the transcripts of the translations people, made by people during the tra first translation and the second translation. And this is the kind of annotation that we have. So we see that for two participants, pa participant 33 and participant 35, for the same sentence, for the same condition, so, uh, we have the tr different translations. Uh, in this C uh, stage, the C and the S uh, refers to change or same. So in stage three, people were really asked if they wanted to change the translation or keep the same translation. So if we look at table three, we see that when the ambiguity, there was ambiguity and the congruence was relative, in 38% of the cases, people actually wanted to change the translation. Uh, if you compare that with all the image congruencies for the respective ambiguous and unambiguous cases, that's like the highest. Also, we see that uh, even though in table four, even though sometimes people say that they want to change the translation, they end up actually retaining the translation. But there's a lot more data to analyze. Uh, we have uh, been able to divide the data. We have been able to do some preliminary pre-processing with the EEG data. We have uh, got some kind of analysis with the fixation durations and uh, how to analyze that, but again, uh, work remains. We've also got this interesting uh, uh, plot where we can see how the eyes progressed while the trans uh, sentence was presented. As we can see, the blue represents the earlier phases, the yellow, the later phases. Now, if you can see here, it's apparent that people started obviously reading through the uh, sentence. Now, if you look at the yellowish regions, we see that when people were asked to really see and like the stages three and four, people first looked at the image and then uh, just focused on some specific parts of the sentence for making the final translation. So. This also requires some further analysis, but this looks promising and interesting. Finally, we have also got some uh, pre-processed uh, version of the EEG data. So this is, a, this is from six different participants who were reading the sentence. So the sentence is the same. Uh, the man is moving an oven using a dolly that you saw before in the pictures. So as we can see, uh, six different people have six different EEGs and it is almost impossible to make any analysis just by looking at it. But however, there are some patterns or there seems to be some patterns. Now, the question is, are these patterns somehow correlated with the gaze data? That is an open research question. Now also the same uh, applies for other stages. For example, we have another uh, recording for the same sentence for the six people, but for the stage of translate. And again, we see that there might be some peaks that might be correlated. So we really need to uh, analyze the data. 
So in summary, we see that from the EMMT and the analysis done so far, there are some effects of Stroop effect that we are look, uh, seeing at the experimental settings. Also, we see that in humans, ambiguity is detected naturally. And uh, well, uh, the, from the gaze data, we have some insights into how the image data is uh, integrated during translation. Next, moving on, uh, I, uh, let's walk over this thing called the multimodal Shannon game. So multimodal Shannon game, as the name suggests, is an extension to the classic Shannon game uh, that we have. So uh, the task is to predict the next word given a particular sentence context. But the twist is we have some multimodal clues here just to help people uh, predict the next word. So as you can see, you have several plates off. So people were supposed to uh, predict the next word. But before prediction, they had to sort of indicate their confidence about their prediction. So let's say that I look at that and I say, well, several plates of broccoli. So I would probably be selecting three or four as my confidence. And then when I do that, people, uh, the pr actual prediction would come several plates of food. And then I'd be like, oh, okay. So how do I evaluate that? So I would say, okay, so maybe I was very close or exact match. So I was very close. I would just say three. So in this way, we collected uh, uh, data from a lot of people and we in fact used a couple of different setups. So this you see was what we call the original setup. We uh, just gave the entire image to the people. Some other configurations that we use were labels all where we just put in bounding boxes along with the labels that we got from a object, pre-trained object detection system. Another setup that we used was, the, was a labels crop, where we just cropped the labels uh, and tried to see how people uh, reacted to that. And finally, labels text, wherein we just had the uh, object labels uh, shown to people. So uh, the analysis shows that the highest confidence score in original is followed. Uh, so the highest confidence is observed in the original and followed by label sol. So the dashes represent the scores and this represents the time. And also we see that the highest evaluation score is seen in original followed by label sol. Interestingly, the maximum time is taken in labels all and labels crop. So when we gave people the entire image context, well, obviously it helped. And so we thought, well, let's make it interesting. So uh, we started analyzing, looking at the POS level data, and we wanted to see what uh, kind of POS uh, uh, scores were there. So we see highest confidence or the self-evaluation score was seen for determ determiners. And we also see for the nouns and the verbs, the scores increase with the additional modality information. So now the question was, could we somehow uh, compared this with our deep learning models. So what we did was we did a comparison with the GPT-2. So we used only two setups because of the text uh, bounds. So we had the no image setup where we just presented only the text and we prepended as like a prompt the, uh, uh, the object labels. And we see that again, uh, highest confidence is for the determiners but well, the additional modality information does not really improve the confidence. So it was, uh, it is, uh, so as I stressed before, we were focusing on two different questions. The first one being, if we give the same task to the machines and humans, how would their comparison be? So this is one experiment in that direction. But again, the evidence is pretty preliminary as well as the experimental setup. Next, uh, we did also did some work on gaze prediction and to put this in context this directly relates to the second question that I was talking about. Can machines be used for uh, predicting cognitive data? This work was actually done as a shared task for a workshop in ACL this year. So the task was to predict eye gaze attributes associated with uh, reading sentences as a regression task. So just to give you an idea of the data that was given to us, so we had words like this and uh, eye tracking attributes such as this. And the goal was to uh, sort of predict these traits in a multilingual setting. And for our submission, we used a few of these configurations. So we mainly focused on uh, the role of context 
which kind of models do really help? Does fine tuning help? The pooling strategy, as in we wanted to create a sentence level representation and the effect of additional lexical information. Interestingly, the only additional lexical information that we were using were word length and word frequency. And so after the experiments, we found out that, well, of course, additional context really helps. XLM based models performed better. Fine tuning again helps. Interestingly, augmenting the addition, or augmenting with additional lexical information, even though uh, it seemed meaningless, actually gave us a lot of uh, gains in the final prediction. And finally, pooling strategy or sentence level representation does not really help. So this was one uh, work that we did uh, on the second question that I was talking about. And finally, this is uh, another experiment that is that is that will be featured in a paper that was just accepted into black box NLP. So the nature of representation of sentences in pre-trained language models. So the purpose of the experiment was to see uh, how well do language models encode certain traits. So we had a particular text input, we fed it to pre-trained uh, language models, we had the vector representation and we performed probing tasks. So what we were really focused on were ambiguity, complexity, and grammaticality. And from the experiments, we uh, have two interesting things to report. First, TF-IDF almost performs, like it performs really well in, like, in situations like detecting ambiguity for the uh, data sets we're using. We were, now, we, expect that we expected the models to be far outperforming the TF-IDF baseline, but as you can see, it doesn't really happen in ambiguity. For complexity, it does. Interestingly, uh, a data set that we use for uh, such analysis with grammaticality, we found out that since it was a very template-based uh, data set, uh, it was really easy for the machines. So we realized that, well, ambiguity is probably very poorly represented in the representations, complexity, well, machines are good at it. So in summary from the machine experiments, the things that we know so far are humans and GPT show some correlation in terms of prediction of determiners when put in a multimodal Shannon game setting. Although, as I said, the evidence is very preliminary and there's, a, there's some experiments, to, more experiments to be done. Also, we see that the current state of the art deep learning systems are not really very good at detecting ambiguity on the same data. Although the performance of the same models on language modeling and NLU tasks is really remarkable. And finally, uh, pre-trained language models, if uh, fine-tuned appropriately, make good predictions on cognitive data. Just to wrap it up, we are really focused on these three questions. If humans and current AI systems were given the same multimodal tasks, how would their performance be compared? I showed uh, results from two experiments that we have done in this to how do we use multimodal deep learning systems to make predictions about observable human brain behavior. I discussed an experiment that we did in this regard. And the far-fetched question, does biological plausibility help in designing systems that exhibit human learning abilities? And so, thank you.